it probably is Welcome to Vlogger Dome, Episode 2. Featuring and welcoming back, Glynos! And with special guest, George Ortega! Welcome to the second edition of Vlogger Dome, the TV show. You know, today's subject is determinism, or free will, as people use the phrase. Um, first, the free thing is really troublesome. There's The free always implies some sort of something that would restrain something or confine something. So the word really doesn't mean anything. There's no, nothing's absolutely free. Um, and will is a complex arrangement of stuff inside your brain. So that's where the subject goes all wrong, is people think there's sort of when they talk about themselves, like I am somebody. <laughs> they think about themselves as being a person inside of their brain. and. There's no person inside of your brain. There's stuff inside of your brain. Like that airplane going overhead, and the cat over there. There's things inside your brain, and they're in certain positions and doing certain things. And you could think of it as a Rube Goldberg, you know, cascade of uh, stuff bouncing around off of each other. Or you can think of it as a mechanism, as a computer or some other device that does specific things, and that these things function quite reliably, like your heart beating. It beats every day, it does this thing over and over and over again, quite reliably, liver's liver, uh, you know, other organs, other organ, and your brain, brains. And your will is a byproduct of brain function and brain states. And uh, what we're really talking about, I guess the subject's really about for most people, is some idea that we have some um, liberal, very liberal, uh, free <laughs> ability to choose to be good people. That we have the, the liberty to choose to go the right road instead of the wrong road. And uh, clearly the physical choice exists. The physical option is within our means. We don't have to be able to grow wings and fly to do the right thing. Um, but in a sense, it's got to be there or it's not going to be there in the byproduct and that's the key word here is byproduct so this video is intended to show will be intended just to kind of demonstrate or prove in whatever little ways we can um, that that's really what's happening here you're a mechanism you're there's no magical force that wills you to do something and your inability to tune in to the goodness force <laughs> would again not be something that happened <clears throat> for some free reason. Um, I think you always, you, you know there's no, well, you know it. I, I don't really have to say any more than that, right? You know it. And you, and you know why you do the right thing. And you know why you do the wrong thing. And uh, it's not because you're free. It's because you have mechanisms that compel you one way or another way. Um, so yeah, that's probably enough. And uh, so what I'll do is deal with some of these words like free and will and determined and conditioned and programming and that should be enough right there. But you know what other ones we can find I'll throw in and uh, in the end you should really understand free will is a nonsensical concept and that what the real truth is is that the universe is determined. Uh, you know there's a past and a future the presence an illusion and things happen because of conditions that exist one moment and then the next moment and the next moment and they're cascading conditions and they're cascading like waterfalls um, sorry but that's just the truth there's no magic there's no fairies there's no fairy godmothers there's no gods there's just no other babble controlling anything it's just photons
and such. Till next time. Uh, continuing. Proceed. This is little Bobby and Jimmy. Let's get a closer look at their brains. All right now, easy, easy, let's open them up. And there you have it, two normal brains. But there is a big difference between Bobby and Jimmy's brain, and it's all to do with how the soil of their minds have been prepared. Your brain is soil. When we understand something, it is made up of all the parts already inside of us. The seed growth of new ideas in your brain is fertilized by the soil of memes already inside your head. There is what you are born with and that which has passed before your senses. And for any new seed growth to occur, for any new concept to take hold, it must be fertilized and given the proper time. Sometimes we don't see the causes that go in, but in they go, and cause they do indeed affect. We don't have a soul, we have soil. So ideas can be seeded and they will grow. But if you have a lot of toxic waste in your soil, if personal experiences have not nurtured the potency of your fertilizer, then it's possible that the seeds of kindness and empathy and understanding, the very best of what we can be as humans, will never flower in your brain. Rage and anger and hate will be the only weeds to claim the territory of your mind and your more graceful potential intellect will be but a tragic missed opportunity and without question make you more of a blight to sentience. If we are lucky, events and moments and memes may trigger growth in us and prevent us from becoming the worst of imposers. But it all begins with how well our soil has been prepared. Previously on Adventures of an Antinatalist. Selfish, you want to go out in the piss with the lads, I think. Want to go out in the piss with the lads, I think. Want to go out in the piss with the lads, I think. Well, I shot Denise. Now I'm going to have to turn myself in. <laughs> Tell me again what happened. I've already told you, I shot Dennis. And what'd you do that for? Well, this is gonna sound strange, but we were having an argument about why I don't want to have kids and- What do you mean you don't want to have kids? Well, I, I don't really think that's very important. No, 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 I want to know why you don't want to have kids. Listen, officer, there's a man there, Dennis, lying down with blood all over him with a bullet in his head. Now, please, no, can no, you... No, 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 you listen to me, Glynos. You're going to tell me why you don't want to have kids or I'm going to lock you up. No, oh, no. Glynos? Okay. So it's like this. We have two options. Either we have children or we don't have children, right? Right. If you have a child, despite your best efforts, you can't really guarantee its welfare. What do you mean? Well, statistically, one in three people are likely to get cancer, one in four will die of heart disease, one in four will be diagnosed with a mental illness, 9% will have diabetes, 74% will break a bone, not to mention homicide, road accidents, an economy on the brink of disaster, future food, water and energy shortages, the fact that one Enough! In... What about, what about all the good things in life? Like what? Like watching the sun rise? So do you really think that somewhere out there there are swathes of unborn children longing to look at a helium hydrogen ball as our planet makes yet another pointless revolution? Alright, on the subject of free will, there is no free will. They're just made up words. We live in a cause and effect universe. There's no room for free anything. Freedom? Free? Free from what? There's only things that are paid for through cause and effect. A free will is an ignorant will. A free will is an uninformed will. What we will do is been predetermined by millions, billions, zillions of interactions between subatomic matter. The word will implies that you have a you choosing, that you have some kind of entity inside of you that makes choices. You are just a product of your subconscious. 
There is no conscious choosing, just subconscious decisions. You are an illusion. You are a byproduct of brain function, brain that interacts with the world and is changed by it. We are infected and fertilized through interaction. You are changed through interaction and exposure. That creates your will. It's a cause and effect world. The idea of a you or an I or a me, it's a fantasy. It's a fable we tell ourselves. You are subconscious brain function. You are not you. You decide nothing. You are just a witness to what your brain will do. Your brain has a personality. Your brain has an identity. You witness what it produces. There is no conscious choosing, just subconscious decisions. Inside your brain, concepts compete with each other. Concepts survive a democratic process that will decide who and what you become. Ideas will decide. Concepts will decide. Life experience will decide. Natural disposition will decide. But you, you decide nothing. Your brain creates. Your brain causes. You, you experience the effect of your brain function. A free will would be an ignorant will. Once you learn how to spell a word correctly, you will recognize incorrect. You won't have a choice to do it wrong on purpose anymore. Intelligence limits will. Our connection to the world is just a connection in time. Um, in the longest progression of time, we are just another turn in the gear work. Uh, we will be no more than we can be and no less <laughs> than we um, must be. All right, a couple of minutes on the word free, as in free will. Okay, <laughs> say uh, free is really just kind of a word. Like a lot of words, we just made it up. People made up the word free. And when they used it, they were saying things like, you know, he's free from his slavery. Um, uh, some sort of unbounding, some sort of lack of restraint was implied by the word. So there was always a force that would have been the thing somebody would have been liberated from. So freedom was a word of liberation from an oppressor for something that was confining. And so that, in the context of a conversation about will, you're really talking about some sort of unconfined will, um, where things like knowledge and understanding wouldn't be at play, that you wouldn't somehow need these things to conform your will like a desire or a compulsion. So clearly we, I think, can all understand that people do things because they have a self-interest, because they are self-motivated, um, motivated by a self-interest, by some construct of their need, their desire mechanism that compels them to do something. And we have the expectation um, that what they'll do is the right thing. And, uh, you know, that they won't do, like this, butterflies been attacked by many birds <laughs> it's all chewed up um, they'll do the wrong thing they'll do the right thing and uh, so we say they're free they have the liberty to do the right thing um, simple counter argument something like once you know that 2 plus 2 equals 4 you're no longer free to believe to believe it equals 5 or 7 or 17 or 700 um, you're now confined. You have no freedom. So you have the right answer. And the right answer has confined you. Knowledge has confined you. Knowledge restricts you. It, it lessens your options. It doesn't expand your options in a very practical way. Obviously, knowledge of mechanics can give you the power to create things and do things. Um, but, um, like I said, there's the other side where once you know something, uh, you can't unknow it, uh, realistically. Uh, you have no liberty, uh, once you know what the right thing is, to do the wrong thing. And that's really the difference between people who do the right thing and people who do the wrong thing, is knowledge of that thing's reality. Um, yeah, pretty much. Till next word. 
So two plus two equals four. Cage! This month, Vlogger Dome proudly welcomes Mr. George Ortega. Mr. Ortega is a seasoned advocate of the concept of determinism, and is the author of several books on the subject, such as Free Will, Its Refutation, Societal Cost, and Role in Climate Change Denial, and Exploring the Illusion of Free Will, which is also the name of a public access television show that he hosts. Let's see what Mr. Ortega has to say about determinism, as he joins Vlogger Domes and Mendham for a chat. Me and uh, George Ortega, we haven't spoken before, so this is our first uh, chance to mess with the subject. And so, uh, George, would you like to say something about yourself, explain your mission on the subject of free will? All right, um, I've been trying to, like, get people to understand we don't have free will for, like, over a decade. Um, I first started at, at Pal Talk. I had like a username Blisser, and like I, I used to go to the atheist rooms there and just like explain it to them. That was, that was around 2006, 2007. Then uh, most recently, I, I live like close to Manhattan, so I started this meetup in Manhattan, uh, exploring the illusion of free will, like in April 2010. So we've been going for like four years, and then like about a year later, I started this TV show here in White Plains, exploring the illusion of free will. And we're up to like episode 170, and we just basically put out the videos trying to describe why free will is an illusion, why it matters to know this. I published a couple of books. I got a website exploring the illusion of free will, uh, causalconsciousness.com, and um, I think we're making progress. It's going to take a while, but it, it, you know, it's been good so far. I think. Yeah, well, it is. A, it's a, I, I consider it one of the more my more difficult subjects, just because you can say cause and effect forever, and then people will just make up some invisible crickets or some kind of thing that made somebody do something, and and so you're kind of defeated because they can always just come up with some sort of extraneous quantum cause or some kind of nonsense, and so you're just stuck with a, a, a this idea. And and I and I guess for, for both of us, we'd understand that the idea that we're a you. A person is sort of an illusion, right? I mean, it's the brain that creates you, and so I sort of call consciousness. We're just witnessing ourselves. Our will is something we witness. We don't really make it. We watch ourselves do stuff, and we really don't have anything to say about it. Our brain—I mean, my brain just made this sentence, right? Absolutely. You no, know, I didn't do it. My brain did it. Yeah, and um, no, so, um, so you said it right. Some, sometimes people will try to say, well, no, not everything's caused. You know, quantum mechanics is like probabilistic or random and stuff. And I mean, like I try to explain to them, hey, that doesn't help. I mean, <laughs> if our decisions are not caused, you know, we can't attribute them to ourselves, you know, what, however you want to define ourself, right? I mean, like, so I mean, basically the, the argument for free will is incoherent. It's just it's self-defeating. Well, even the word free, I also have a big problem with because, you know, traditionally free is always tied to some opposite restriction. You know, you free a slave, you free a prisoner, you liberate something from a binding. So what is the binding that we're being liberated from? I mean, you're obviously not going to be liberated from your desire. If somebody puts a piano on your foot, um, you're going to be pretty harshly compelled to get that piano off your foot, and all the freedom in the world isn't going to help you. Oh, yeah, and like we've known this since grade school. I mean, like we're taught in school, you know, human behavior, animal behavior is nature and nurture, environment, genetics. There's no room there for free will. It's like we, we understand this. Yeah, uh, and I guess it's just an ego thing. People are just uncomfortable with the idea of declaring themselves a programmed computer, because you know that's sort of humiliating. Okay, yes, okay, we're just we're just programs. You know, I'm running Windows, you're running Bindos. You know, you're you're a loser, loser o. You know, I'm winner o. Um, you know, and so you're just comparing software now. You know, and and uh, you know, I think people want to think they're more special than the software that they're running. Well, I address that in two ways. Like for naturalist scientists, basically, you know, this chain of cause and effect goes back to the Big Bang. 
So basically, we're manifesting the universal will. Okay, that's one way to see it. Or if you're religious, I mean, 80% 80 of, of people here in the United States are religious. So, like, I try to appeal to them also. So if they want to think of it in terms of theological constructs, whatever, we are manifesting God's will. So either way, whether it's um, universal will or God's will, that kind of, like, elevates our our existence to, you know, to something much more than just a human being. So, Yeah, well, that's another way I've thought of the question. You know, was, I would just put it to somebody who's believing in God, you know, well, what's God's will? I mean, where does that come from? So he sits around forever, and then one day he decides to make humans? I mean, it just occurs to him, like, in his will, it just... I was here forever for a zillion, billion, zillion years, and then one day I decided, oh yeah, let's do this human thing. I mean, what did his, what did, what conformed his will? Where did he get the idea from? And it's more than that. If, if we attribute omniscience or all-knowingness to God, if he knew a billion years ago what he'd be doing today, even God lacks free will today. So he's, he's as much a robot or a puppet as we are. Well, he obviously has a motivation. At least the Christian God, you'd have to say he was motivated by some personal ambition. You know, he had some sort of idolatry in his own head that he wanted something to, you know, bow to him and pray to him and love him and all that stuff. So he seems like he has some issues that he was addressing, and he doesn't seem like he was free of those issues. Right, and, and whether you want to attribute causality to us as human beings or as God or God, the same, the same illogic basic phenomenon happens. Basically, like this causal chain that stretches back to before the Big Bang, because we know we don't know what happened, but like logically, it stretches back indefinitely. That also applies to God. So we never get to a point where we or God decided anything. Yeah, I, I guess I, I, we could argue the whole affinity argument forever, but I, I tend to think that time runs out. I did I did watch a few of your videos, and one of them you did end it with a statement that you sort of do believe in God, but I guess it's a pantheist type God, right? It's the net net composition of the universe kind of God. Yeah, if, if the universe is everything and God is everything, then God is universe. If the if God is all powerful, God is the laws of nature. I mean, it's yeah. Person. Well, so, so I might it might be a semantics argument, but I would almost argue argue that just as I think it's important for people to let go of free will, I think it's sort of important for them to let go of this idea of a designer or a creator or, you know, a mission statement. There's clearly not a mission statement. Um, you know, it's crude forces all the way down and, you know, and we're just, uh, we're, we're an eddy in the stream, right? A simple function, right? Water going downhill can create very complex patterns in the water, but that complexity doesn't mean anything. It just is a consequence of friction, and when you build up energy, it spins around in circles and does funky things. I think um, because I'm a person, because we're people, I think, therefore, I, I prefer to personify reality, you know, re re relate to, to nature, to the universe as a, a person rather than a thing. Um, when, when we talk about not having free will, some very interesting um, implications arise. For example, if you do something intelligent, you know, we'll label it intelligent, whatever it might be. You might say something intelligent, right? But you don't have a free will. That intelligent act, statement, thought cannot be attributed to you. So it has to be attributed to this universal causal chain. So in other, in other yeah. words... I don't even think you have to go back to the universe to find that relationship. Clearly, I have, you know, I've sort of had this philosophical discussion with people, and it's like we can't really change ourselves, but we really can change other people. So I, it's easier for me to affect you than it is for me to affect me. You know, I can have more of an impact on you than I can on myself because of this whole, the fact that we are just these reflexive organisms. I can add something that you don't have. Um, you know, much easier to you than I can do anything to change me. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I understand that, but either way, you know, whether you're changing me or yourself, I mean, none of it is up to us. That's that's the interesting fact. I mean, we're just, well, just like, we're all byproduct, and we're byproduct of the environment that has interacted with us. So the things that have dented us have made us. So in that sense, we're not we we can't take credit for what we are because we're sort of the 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 reflexive reaction of the world that banged us into shape.
Exactly, exactly. Vloggerdome will return with another portion of this interview very soon. You think way too much about this stuff, Klinos. Well, you asked me why I don't want to have children, so I'm just telling you. Yeah, yeah, but all that stuff you said about the future and that... Yeah. Well, well I think that if you just think positively about it, then everything will be alright. But, but that's just pretending and lying. Exactly, yeah. If, if you want to believe all that depressing stuff about the future and food shortages and cancer and that, then, then that's up to you. But I, I'm much happier just thinking it's going to be alright. Well, that's just fucking retarded. Well, you have your opinion and I have my opinion, Glynos. Ah, yeah. What were you saying about uh, that Dennis that you shot? Yeah, I, I shot and killed him after we had an argument. Nah. What do you mean, nah? Filing a murder case is much too much paperwork, boy. But I, but I killed him, I shot his fucking head off! Nah, nah, nah. I'd much rather believe that the pistol fairies came and took him off to Gunheaven. Huh, really? Yep, you're free to go. Uh, okay. See you later, officer. Cheerio, Glynos. <laughs> ah, I finally benefited from people's idiocy. The Amazing Atheist. Oh, no. Hey, guys. I've got a new DVD out called Un... Alright, on the subject of the will part of free will. <laughs> yes, will is brain. Um, and brain is mechanism, and the mechanism has parts, and the parts are physiological hardware, and then there's lots of software, um, lots of programming, conditioning, um, experience, life experience. We see how our will changes, and we see how long it takes us to learn lessons in life. Uh, it can take people decades sometimes to come to realizations. And uh, the will is just a byproduct, conscious phenomenon. It happens. We feel it, like I'm going to do it, <laughs> you know, like, but you have to, and there's many times that we have to think about something, do we really want to do this? Um, you could come up with scenarios like gambling, you know, and what, what, what really pushes you, that little la last push to do something, to roll the dice, to, you know, whatever the thing would be. And you can feel the tension created inside of your brain um, as the different mechanisms, the different parts of yourself say now and another part says no wait a second and, another part, and they just don't agree and it's not until something some mechanism in that fight um, tips the balance one way or another with a piece of evidence a piece of some kind of knowledge like you better roll the dice everybody's watching you you're looking like an idiot um, some sort of realization some sort of conceptual notion will tip the balance but all of it happens subconsciously. I'm talking right now. I'm composing sentences. I have no idea what I'm going to say. Uh, well, I have an idea. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like the wrong way to put it. I sort of know this sounds like me, so I have some idea of it. Um, but I didn't do any of this. This is all just flying out, okay? This whole thing called my personality is just stuff flying out of me. I'm not making it the I thing. The witness isn't making this stuff happen. So it's another way of looking at it is I think if you were honest with yourself, you could see that your consciousness is kind of a witness to your behavior. You behave um, and you kind of witness it. The cat meowed, I turned around to look. These are all reflexes, all reactions. And just like you, I said, wow, he just did that. Uh, you might not have said the wow part because isn't that terribly interesting. Yeah, I don't know what to see. He has a will. He has a cat will. He has a composition of his brain, a construction, that has him behaving like a cat. I have a construction that's built on this simian blueprint, um, you know, and I'm motivated and compelled by a certain set of desires and, and uh, physiological mechanisms, and uh, my behavior is semi-reliable, and certainly for my personality, it's very reliable. And so my will is a byproduct of my personality, and my personality is a byproduct of my life experience. And that's kind of how it works. There's a car coming in, so we'll finish up there. Till the next word.
on the subject of consciousness. Consciousness is a brain function that, like all biological functions, has existence because it provided circumstantial advantage in the competitive struggle of evolutionary natural selection. Consciousness is produced by an arrangement of material substance, but the substance of consciousness is likely just an illusion or projection synthetic aesthetically produced in what might be termed the theater of the mind. The main components of consciousness are feelings and thoughts. It can be reasonably metaphored that feelings attempt to represent or create value in circumstances, and that thoughts attempt to resolve those values by running logical equations. An extension of the function of consciousness in humans has allowed them to do logical equations judging the credibility of the value designations applied by their own feeling brain. Through this mechanism, humans can rise above crude qualities of native selfish feeling disposition and conditioning. To some extent, humans can think themselves into a more accurate, or if need be functional, feeling disposition. Human consciousness, although biologically created, can become substantially programmed by knowledge that is evolving outside the bounds of biological evolution. Although feelings have personal motivational power, accurate conceptual understanding acquired through thought exercise and knowledge acquisition is the real power of the human consciousness. The knowledge held in human consciousness is an evolving filter, now empowered to shift the important truths from the sea of meaningless rambling that is the universe. All right, a couple minutes on choice, uh, which is really brains decide they don't choose. Um, I'm choosing to be very close to these bees even touching them, you know, even a wasp, because they're feeding, I know they're pretty uninterested in fighting, because they're not protecting their hive or their home, they're just collecting food. So I can play with them, because I know this. So I can make a choice, a decision, to play with the bees, in a way that most people, or some people might say, don't do that, especially if you're allergic to bee stings. Um, but it's relatively safe, so I know that. And knowing that gives me the ability to choose to decide to uh, attempt that fate. Uh, if I set up a scenario where you have to jump some kind of barrier, and if you miss, you fall into a vat of crocodiles, well, if the, f if the barrier, if the jump is only a foot, you'll decide, your brain, to jump it for maybe $50. And there'll be some point, though, where the gap will be wide enough where you will choose not to jump for the $50 and decide it's not worth it. Um, the risk is too high. But it'll be a decision your brain makes. It'll be a decision based on what you understand about the likelihood of you succeeding versus the um, how, how necessary it is not to fail, the necessity of not failing, um, and how much you need 50 bucks. All these things will decide how much you tempt your fate and play with the, um, the danger. Uh, a lot of wasps in here. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, never mind. Um, which are a little more aggressive. Uh, obviously. Anyway, um, so yeah, there's choice is a word we use. Again, these are all words invented by human beings. But you really don't make choices. You, your brain makes decisions based on different interests balanced on a scale built into your personality, your psychology. And uh, as we notice in life, people have different scales based on how much they're afraid of the negative potential consequences of tempting the fate um, and how 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 much they're how much they need to tempt the fate how much they need to play uh, the game uh, 
the fifty dollars and that's how the decisions will be made so choice is sort of an illusion or a phony word decisions the real word and decisions are a product of a process that makes the decision it, yeah all right to the next word and such so we got the technology part and you know the other part that's evolving is our philosophical understanding our this this shit how we can describe our circumstance and how honest we can be about it and how accurate we can do it in terms of understanding where we are and what we're doing here and how we can function and what the solutions are and that's us the other side to this intelligence thing and i would argue that it's just inevitable that this negative perception is going to have to be the winner in the end because it's the truth it is that simple it's the truth i'm sorry but it's the truth the universe is cold and chemically and it's full of acid and nasty and it's just brutal it's matter cooking it's matter freezing it's matter flying apart and in this little sanctuary where we have a little bit of protection this happened but all this is all this chemistry is is been manufactured to consume reproduce cannibalize you know through a mechanism of sensitive want a mechanism of passion that compels us not reason not logic not the intelligence the intelligence can only really be a slave to our addiction in terms of having a, a functionality I mean, if we weren't making a problem, intelligence would have nothing to do. The best part of intelligence is figuring out how to do something to satisfy and comfort the afflicted. And just by bizarre circumstance, we're able to step out of the maze, to climb up on the walls because we have this intelligence, to look at it, to survey the circumstance, and to say, is this a game worth playing? And certainly to say, is it ethical? to force somebody else to play it. I don't think so, because there's nothing to be gained. There's nothing to be gained to drag somebody out of nowhere and throw them into this poorly constructed somewhere. It's not good enough. It can't be good enough, because the only thing it feeds on is this competition, is this gratification through consumption. And the only way to consume to satisfy an ego is usually um, at something else's expense. It's not a good story. Our origins aren't a good story. What life is doing in the real world, the natural world, isn't a good story. And the easiest solution is to quit imposing it, quit creating new victims. And now more from Inmendum and George Ortega. I'd say the it's, blame is sort of irrelevant to me. I mean, I don't, you know, blame or credit. And and so there's many people that take this free will argument to some sort of argument that, um, well, if there's no free will, then everybody's off the hook for being a jerk. And I would sort of argue that, you no, know, you can still be defined as dysfunctional or broken or useless or stupid or you know we can still call you some nasty names um, even if we're not blaming you yeah well the, the issue of blame has implications beyond our personal self I mean I just published a book in April free will its refutation societal cost and role in climate change denial I mean Pew Research did a, um, a survey earlier this year and found 66% of Americans are in denial that climate change is happening and we're causing it. All right, so when you understand what denial is, it's a psychological defense, defense mechanism that works unconsciously that's a response to being blamed for something. So in other words, like without the free will construct, these people would be able to not blame themselves for what we're doing to the planet, perhaps look at the evidence objectively, and maybe we can start like making some progress on it. So like this <clears> issue of, of like our not having a free will has vast implications that, that so far aren't really acknowledged or recognized that much. 
Well, I, I, I certainly can appreciate the fact that it would it would put logic as a higher premium because you're basically saying what's the best or the rightest program. You know, you could you could basically say that we are programming, and you're basically just going to make a comparison about what program gets the job done the most efficiently. You know, so you could basically critique people for being too high maintenance, and you could critique people for being wasteful and all of that kind of thing just because their programming isn't making them very functional. They're basically a lemon and uh, we should go with a different model. <laughs> we should invest in a better model, let's say. Right. I mean, what, I, what I'm saying though is like, you know, the reason these people can't look at the evidence is because they're blaming themselves. You know, if a scientist tells them, you know, like, you, because of your free will, are endangering civilization on the planet, you know, lives of your children, grandchildren, great children, they can't handle it. If, if they didn't believe in free will, they wouldn't feel indicted. So yes, I, you're right. I mean, we're still going like, to uh, hold on to blame and guilt and, and we're going to like feel good about the things we do. But we have to see it in the right way. We have to understand that, no, that's, that's actually just an illusion. Nothing is up to us. And that way we can start seeing reality as it truly is. Yeah, I guess that would still leave them in the, 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 with an ego deficit problem where they'd have to concede their Windows 95. And, you know, you know what I'm saying. They'd still have to concede they're a clunker. And, and they'd still want to avoid having that designation placed on them and they'll still come up with rationalizations to say no I'm a perfectly good operating system I'm doing perfectly fine so uh, you know I, I guess it is it's a semantics argument again where I don't think it'll probably change the fact that too many people are too nihilistic and too selfish and they don't want to hear any part of the truth that doesn't have something to do with what they get you know when I when I started doing the shows I thought that people would get it much more clearly and strongly than they have I thought that people would be ashamed to not understand this, this simple principle of causality. What I've realized is, yeah, human beings, not just the average person, but academics, are really, really not very intelligent. I mean, they, they don't know how to think. And yeah, I, I think sometimes maybe like people need to be shamed into understanding that because there's a lot of like academic arrogance out there. People think they know stuff when all they do is they learn something, they remember it, they recite it for a test, and sometimes they apply it. They think they're intelligent. We're living in a very unintelligent world. Yeah, and it, it clings, too. I guess that's part of this free will argument, too. It clings to the old knowledge, the old perceptions, and it just doesn't want to be forced out of the box of those comfortable notions. And you know, It just doesn't want to accept the fact that there's this linear line of intelligence, and it moves in a direction and you're going to go there anyway. You can't stop it. You're not going to stop the airplane. You're not going to stop certain things. And it's like they just keep resisting because they don't want that clinical truth. They don't want that cold water of evolution and big bangs and cause and effect. And, you know, that's just too much cold water for them. And you can explain it because, I mean, we're hardwired. One, the reason we don't have one way of explaining why don't have, we don't have a free will is because we're hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain. We're hedonic creatures, so it's very understandable that when people are telling um, the average person, no, you know, nothing's up to you, you're just a robot, a computer, you know, people aren't going to want to accept that. You kind of like what I've been struggling with is a way to make that reality more more acceptable to people, you know, but, but yeah, until they, they find a way to say, hey, fine, you know, like my life still has meaning, then they're not going to believe it. They're not going to, they're going to choose not to understand it because that, they're programmed that way. That's all the time we have to hear from Inmendum and George Ortega this episode, but be sure to check out our YouTube channel, Vloggerdome, for the full interview. You can also check us out on Twitter and Facebook, more social media sites coming to Vloggerdome soon. And if you'd like to make a counter-argument to anything said in this episode, please contact us with a message of some kind or a video response, and your argument back to us could make it on the show next episode. Hope to hear from you! And to see more of Mr. Ortega, please visit www.causalconsciousness.com. Right, a couple of minutes uh, looking at determinism, free will, from the perspective of a concept like reflexes reflexes. Um, it certainly could be argued that uh, everything we do is a byproduct of a reflex. Uh, word associations, um, the reflex of kind of categorizing things. The, this falls into the category of flowers. Uh, this is the category of big flowers and there's small flowers. 
big, small, low, high. These are all reflexes of our brain, um, beyond all the mechanical reflexes of, you know, physical reflexes that are hardwired into our brain. Uh, you know, pain sensations, the reflex of getting away. Um, um, you know, those are just so obviously visceral and mechanical and, um, you know, they're very controlling. So you can see there's this, 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 there should be a dissonance in your head with this concept of free when you can see everything about yourself is so controlled. You are controlled in your responses by the stimulus. You have connections. You know, uh, if A and B are both on, then C is put in the on position, is basically the logic of all these reflexes. And uh, so we combine features and then create categories, and then the category becomes a property, and then the, that property becomes something that might get you put in a new category. And it's just a bunch of reflexive connections connecting little moth, butterflies, other insects. Uh, insects are related to crustaceans in the ocean. I mean, the connections go on and on. They're all reflexive reactions, um, conceptual reactions, and they're just as real as your knee jerk or, you know, elbow funny bone thing. Uh, physiological reactions like laughter, or say being ticklish, these are reflexes, and there's no. Um, uh, most of it is very controlling. Some of it's controlling in the sense that it'll create a desire, like a an amount of hunger, like you'll be really hungry or just a little bit hungry. <laughs> you'll have a very loud motorcycle or something more reasonable and civilized. Um, but I mean, all these responses and all these reactions that take place. Uh, are just a mechanical processing um, based on the disposition created inside of your mind space. But there's no entity that does a choice. The choosing is based on the disposition, uh, the properties of those reflexes in terms of what they have been educated to understand. Uh, you have to be educated to understand that uh, there's a relationship between insects and crustaceans, or even humans and fish. Um, these are things that require education to know. They're reflexive reactions you're not going to have unless you have been disposed to reflexively have that reaction. Yeah, probably enough. Thank you very much. Well, it's this idea that you're evaluating your own character all the time, right? And and you know when you are uh, doing right and doing wrong, ultimately. <laughs> Certainly, there's just this idea that yeah, although you don't, um, you know, it's, it's not putting too much pressure on yourself. Obviously, I mean, you're striving for perfection, but you know, you're that's really not realistic. So you accept little cheats here and there, along the way, just to keep you in the game. You know that you're going to have to. You, know, you can't just all day be thinking about animals with electrodes in their brain or something. Yeah. You, know, you, you do have to vacation. Yeah. Uh, you, can't, you can't meditate on the suffering of the world forever without losing your mind, essentially, and becoming... <laughs> Well, I mean, even if you're going to be a janitor, you still have to know you have to go to sleep. It's you know just something to preserve yourself in the function of your duty. Well, that duty, that intrepid duty, is the the thing that I'm interested in. Well, that's what I just I hate about the conversation in a way is is that it's you know the word heroic you always end up tainting it because you say you, you know you do have to do this personalizing thing to motivate yourself and um, you know so you do end up personalizing your altruism you know sort of ego it's an ego badge you know? right. And yeah. it's, you know, I'm going to feel good about myself, or I'm going to get a Nobel Prize, or I'm going to get this, or I'm going to do, you know, and you, you, you can, you sort of have to do some of that 
to get yeah. yourself to do it, you know, and, and it's just, it's a little bit irritating that there has to be this ulterior motive that you have to, you know, you have to feed the monkey, I was, as I was sort of saying, you know what I mean? You have to bribe the monkey into doing it. That is an interesting point, yeah. You know, so on the one, one hand, you have this element of yourself where you are judging yourself and <clears throat> striving, and then on the other hand, that's an you know that's nothing more than ego, as you're suggest suggesting. <laughs> well, I'm just saying the the ideal brain is still traveling on top of the monkey, <laughs> you know, and so it has to it has to contrive, you know, ways to get the monkey to do what it wants. You know what I mean? It, yeah. And the monkey doesn't going to do it just because it says it's the right thing to do. No, you got to make it more real for the monkey. The yeah. monkey ain't going to do it just because it's the right thing to do, you know. You've got to make the monkey say, oh, you're going to be humiliated. Everybody's going to know you have a small penis or, you know what I mean. You have to you have to do something to drive the monkey to it. I think it's more of a literal truth than a figurative truth, um, you know, just in the sense that, um, yeah, as a practical matter, this is kind of how we work. Um, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a scheming tool on top of a motivating tool. And then the, and the catch is, is don't 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 let your brain fall into those that role playing. Don't allow your brain to be a tool the monkey uses. Allow your brain to use the monkey. Gonna have safe sex, gonna have safe sex, gonna not make a baby, and it's gonna be awesome. Do 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 Are you almost ready? I just wanna say how incredibly excited I am that you know we're like not about to make a baby together. And I am like so ready to have what I'm sure is gonna be like the greatest safe non-procreative sex with you, like, ever. You know, because it's like, you know, the thing about babies is that, you know, you love them, and then they die. Like, there's like a million and twelve fucking ways for them to die. And, you know, I'm just not having that. And so I'm ready to have, you know, like, some good lower extremities types of feelings with you instead of opposing all of that on a tiny little new sentient creature in this world and and I know you are too because because you're an antinatalist right you goddamn fucking right I'm an antinatalist ooh yeah I'm an antinatalist baby ooh yeah Oh yeah, me too, baby. That, like, not making babies suffer and die is just so, like, hot. That, like, not bringing new life into this nightmare of a world just to experience suffering and pain and then death. Oh, baby, you got me so hot. You get in here and do what you were genetically programmed to do. But don't forget me first. Oh, we could never forget about you, Mr. Condom. We could never forget about you, Mr. Condom. You make all of our babies not possible, and we love you for that. Mm. Nine! You must have that baby! What the? Is your jizz talking to us? Why must we make that baby? Uh, that's weird. And look, I really don't think we need to have that baby for any reason at all. Yes, you must have that baby. That baby is going to grow up and hurt and torture lots and lots of people and be a very important person and be the greatest ruler of all time. And you are evil if you don't make that happen. Do as the DNA commands you to. Do as I, the Hitler sperm, command you to. Give in. Make that baby. Oh, hell the fuck no. We like refusing shit, and we don't believe on imposing new life, and making more slaves and all that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna put on this goddamn condom, and I will not be cock-blocked by my own goddamn semen, and that's final. 
God commands you to. LOL, what God? Yeah, I don't think you can prove an existence of a God. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Behold, God, the DNA molecule. Have that baby. Oh, shit. Yeah, kind of a tricky word. Predictability or prediction or <sighs> predictive. Um, you know, how much of what we are. Can we see this idea of prediction where we could anticipate or understand that we're going to do a certain thing, that we would see something and say, oh yes, that would make a good background, let me put that in the background. It's just a simple calculation and that we sort of already know that and about ourselves. If, if somebody was to ask me a hundred questions, uh, what would you do in this circumstance? Those questions I would sort of know the answer to kind of quickly. You kind of have an impression about what kind of person you are. You kind of know from your past behavior what uh, kind of decisions you're going to make. And uh, so we are very structured. And uh, so it's another bit of evidence that there really is a lack of randomness or freedom in how we behave. We behave very consistent with uh, uh, what we have as accepted as an understanding of the world and how it functions and how I am the brain. Um, uh, is, is supposed to navigate. Um, it's the proper way to navigate. We all have that kind of a definition inside of ourselves. And we all kind of know that, uh, yeah, we really don't do anything erratic unless there's a cause to make us erratic, um, something to break uh, that natural function. Um, I think some people could even know pretty realistically predict what they would do in, when they're drunk even because they kind of know the, the theme of what is the, the repression that's trying to get out or the, the animal, uh, the, the, um, what, what part of them, what part of their personality might be more dominant when they're inebriated. Uh, and they might even be able to predict that pretty reliably about what exactly you would do if uh, you were drunk in a circumstance. Um, so yeah, let's, you know, it, it just all, when you seem to add up these little pieces, it all adds up to kind of a mechanical device and uh, very little room, no room, reasonably, rationally, um, for some notion that there's something else besides the condition that you're in. You're in a condition and you've been brought to that condition through years of, of experience with the world and you've learned how to be a certain personality and uh, you're going to behave consistent with that personality. Yeah, <laughs> it's you know, simple enough. Yeah, till next time. And so in conclusion, we are all just a collection of memes, experiences, events, chemistry. Just one more reason why we are doomed. The trick is to try to not fuck anyone else over as much as possible. Try not to impose as much as possible. Just being alive makes you a taker. Every happiness paid for in the suffering of other sentient creatures. You are, in fact, an asshole. Try not to be as much of an asshole as possible. Extremely important for all of us to understand all the myriad ways in which we are in fact dangerous in this world. No matter how small, no matter how powerless, you will in fact have an impact. Use whatever power you may have to minimize the suffering. Please?
Thanks for watching. Be sure to check us out next month as we explore education reform. See you there.